My pleasure to moderate this afternoon's uh, session, uh, which is uh, one of the ones that we were really thought, well, this is a great topic uh, for a workshop strongly focused on moving across levels of, of uh, analysis on uh, the big topics, because uh, the whole point of the brain gaining information is eventually to make decisions uh, and to trans, uh, translate the information into action. And in this, in the area of decision making, we have what, at least by the standards of cognitive psychology, is a rather good and rather successful uh, a computational model, which has been the drift diffusion model, which has been fit to a very broad range of data, and which, unlike most models in cognitive psychology, actually accounts for a lot of the quantitative properties, not just the means, but the whole distributions and so on. Um, and this model has become influential in the neurobiological field. And it raises exactly the question, first of all, is the model itself correct? Is it the model that we should be using? About which, of course, there's controversy. And then secondly, even if it is the model about, that we should be using, how do you translate from this computational level to how this is uh, the, the variables in this computational model, how are they actually realized at the neurobiological level? And that, if anything, even more controversial. And that's what today's session is about. And the first speaker is Conrad Gordon. Thanks so much for having me here. I have not worked much in this field. And, uh, and yet I'm the first speaker, so I'll have to tell you about this field. And I'll try to give you an overview. Now, uh, that will be very easy for me because I taught this class of models. So, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, but like, we need to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So, think, think about experiments like that. We have a bunch of dots in some area, and uh, they're moving. And uh, we want you to estimate if they're moving left or if they're moving right. And uh, what we can do is we can make it so that either all, if all dots move into a random direction. In that case, you can't tell me if they're moving left or right. Or we could make it that half of them, that half of them are not just going straight, and the half of them are moving into random directions. Now it's kind of hard to figure out how they move, or here, all of them are moving to the right. So, what is cool about this experimental setup is we can titrate how hard it is. We can titrate how much information we get. In fact, if all, of, all but one go, uh, or like if we have 100 going away, and the one go left, it will be very hard for me to say anything meaningful about which direction they go. And so, it's a beautiful experiment, and at some level this is the experiment in the decision science of neuroscience. So it's a really important area, and a really exciting area, and, and one of the biggest questions. So, let, uh, let, let me see if I can show it to you here. Uh, That's from Wikipedia. Which direction is it moving? <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> right. Yeah, this is right. Um, I think there's some, you know, some dots that move into the opposite direction, but, but the nice thing is now we have a stimulus, we can give it, we can dial how uncertain they are, and we can run lots of experiments with them. Now, we can think about this experiment in a nice way as a Bayesian estimation part. So what does that mean? So what we, what we are, are there, if we are, if we are the person doing that experiment, we see those dots move, and we can ask ourselves, well, which direction are they moving? What we have is we basically get information over time. Now, every frame, we can see how the points move. And if I, if I show you, say, that for one second, you can get some information from the first hundred milliseconds, some information from the second half, and so on and so forth. The idea is that it keeps moving in the same direction over that interval. And that too is natural. So in the real world, Oftentimes, when there's movement, it's a movement that kind of keeps going. So, we want to calculate what's the probability of the hypothesis x. The hypothesis here is go, it, it goes left. What's the probability of that? 
given what we saw in the first 100 milliseconds, the second 100 milliseconds, and so on and so forth. So these are the observations that we have here. Well, we can use Bayesian for that. I, 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 much of my work is in Bayesian statistics. So that will, Bayesian will tell us that this is proportional to the probability that it goes left or right. So it could be that in 90% of the cases it goes left. In that case, the probability of left will be big, the probability of right will be small. If you even do give me very little information, I will probably guess that it goes left because in 90% of the cases it goes left. So that's the P of X. And then, so here this is just the chain rule. So times the product of the probability of what I saw based on everything up to that time. And now what we can say is that the typical noise that we have in our visual system is arguably, um, is, is arguably doesn't care about the past. So we can say each, given that it's moving to the left, what I see here in each interval will just depend on it going left, it will not depend on what I saw in previous times, unless we start believing that it evolves over. But we will assume here it goes with a constant speed. The stimulus is constant. So therefore, we, can, we have what's called conditional independent. If I know that it goes left, then each frame gives me some information. We can just calculate the product of that. OK, so now what will we get from there? We, uh, so, so this is the calculation of the probability. Now what we typically do is we calculate in the log domain because then products become uh, sums and I can't say much of them any more things about it. So the probability of it going left in all the things that we saw is now the log probability that it goes right plus the sum over all the time intervals of the log of the probability of what I saw in that time interval given the direction of movement be left here. And now, what's nice here is we have now have something that's, it, that's to be integrated. If I want to know if it goes left or right, the best thing that I could do is I take the log of this and I integrate it. And under certain circumstances, this takes it on a Gaussian distribution. Even if it wasn't a Gaussian distribution, by the time I have enough steps, it will be a Gaussian distribution. Due to the central limit theorem, and unless probability distributions are active. So, now we have two parameters here. We basically have we have a mean probability there, which is if it's going left, what's the probability that I see the kind of thing that I see when it's going left? And uh, then we have noise on it. And so now we only have two parameters that characterize that. How much does it provide us evidence into the correct direction? And how much uh, and what's the variance there? And for example, we, we, we could experimentally cure these things independently. Let's say we could make most frames black. Then the variance would be large. No, we don't see anything in that case. And then when we see something, it could be very good. Or alternatively, each frame just provides very weak information for one thing, but it's another thing. So what this calculation shows is that if we want